dearly beloved. <laughs> All right. So Swift was open sourced and released, and we have it. We can use it, and it's lovely, right? But there's, there's one point that people like to hammer on, and it's that Swift is young. Truth be told, I think that this is a strength. Uh, I'm, I'm going to defend this position later, but I think that Swift's youth and the fact that it is so early in Swift's development actually is one of the most exciting things about Swift. Before we really talk about Swift evolution and how we can help be good shepherds of this language, I really think that we need to consider what Apple's vision for Swift is. For this, I tend to go to Chris Latner. I'm going to quote him a couple times, but the whole core team is, has been very vocal and very forthcoming with their opinions and the history of Swift and what's guided their decisions. And I think that that's actually one of the best and most worthwhile contributions of Swift evolution. But Swift is meant to fully span the gamut of programming. What does that mean? Well, from writing the lowest level firmware up to the highest level application program. And Apple actually started at the end of that, right, with application programming. Swift, the, the full quote here acknowledges that Swift as released in 1.0 and you know, 2.0 even, is, is much more an application programming language than it is a low-level firmware program language. And what Chris Latner actually was pointing out is that we want to accomplish one of those tasks well first, and then backfill and fi uh, figure out what, what does the language need to become a good system language, and add those things in carefully, methodically, and with attention to what what the implications of any given feature are. Now that we have a long-term sense of what Swift is meant to do, let's actually talk about the short term, the, the nuts and bolts of the next release and the release just after that, 2.2 and 3.0. The main goal for 2.2, which is upon us, basically, right? it's in the Xcode 7.3 beta, is safety. It's a pretty cautious release. Uh, if we think about what, what they're going to do, it's, everything is developer friendly in that it, it shouldn't have too many source changes. You shouldn't have to rethink how you approach Swift and how you write code in Swift. Um, so let's, let's look at some of these, these goals. Um, quality of implementation improvements. Right? Those are you know, not necessarily improvements to the user-facing feature directly in a, in a very clear way, but you know, the, the implementation de determines what can be changed, as, as all of you hopefully are aware, you know, as software developers. A bad implementation really stifles the things that you can do later on. Finishing touches on 2.0 features. So things that were added in 2.0, we can update those, we can change those, we can refine those, but hopefully none of those are breaking changes. Right? We're trying very hard to only add and augment you know, the language, add to and augment the language. No fundamental changes to Swift's use. You should not have to, after 2.0 is official, change really basic approaches in your app. Uh, but there are some deprecations in preparation for 3.0. Right? They, they've used some of the lovely features in Swift to warn us that, hey, this, uh, what is it, the post and prefix operators are good examples. Those two operators are going away, so you should consider using plus one or you know, minus one or something like that. If we look at the implemented goals for Swift 2.2, which we're actually just going to you know, sort of quickly move through, these line up very much with the stated goals. Very few of these are breaking changes. And the, and the one that I'll call out, which is type alias, uh, changing to associated type in specific instances, is a good example of, well, type alias was used for, for two different concepts that weren't really related. And the change, while source breaking, isn't 
actually uh, devastating because hopefully it will actually clarify the language. It'll make it more simple to use. We have more of the same with accepted proposals. Right? Um, these changes clarify, they, they focus the language, and they don't break how we approach Swift. So stability is, is the big concern. And actually, stability means that certain things are out of scope, mostly because they're a great deal of work, and they don't affect stability. Since stability is the core goal of 3.0, if it, if it can wait until after the things that you know, set a good foundation for the language, they, they might actually have to wait. So let's look at those out of scope features first. You know, full source compatibility. This is, like I said, is one of the big complaints. Um, and unfortunately it's not going away, but I will say that it is one of the nicest things about Swift 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 is that the Apple is willing to break things to fix uh, mistakes, especially fundamental mistakes in semantics. Um, the first example being the arrays. When Swift was first announced, everyone was up in arms about arrays. And it's, Apple actually changed it. They, they put in the time, they, they shifted their timeline to re-implement arrays. And that's a great indicator of how open Apple is to actually you know, considering feedback. Concurrency is out of scope. And uh, I think concurrency is one of the best examples of something that is out of scope, not because Apple thinks it's not important, but because the other features that are in scope for 3.0 are necessary to, to build a good solution. C++ interoperability, as much as we can interoperate, uh, you know, as much as we can work with C and Objective-C, we unfortunately don't get to use C++, but you know, in time, in time. Hygienic macros, so the ability to have, uh, to, to have things that are slightly more generic than generics even, right? And new library functionality. Um, Swift, a Apple has provided a good foundation, a good small core for us to build from. And until we have stability and a few other features, there are a lot of things that we would have to re-implement once we got those. So what is in scope for 3.0? Stable API and resilience. This is the core uh, goal of Swift. And what do we mean? Well, right now, every time you build an app in Swift, they package in a little version of Swift. Well, LibSwift goes into your app, and it bloats your app just a tiny amount. But the reason that that happens is because without that, you would have a pretty hard time actually uh, working after an update to, to Swift. Right? And this is made even more apparent if you have a stack, you, know, you have a couple libraries within your app, and something is built in Swift 2.0, and then you update to Swift 2.1. The whole stack needs to be re rebuilt right now because we don't have the stability that Apple is after right now. Portability. Swift works on Apple platforms and now also Linux. Uh, but some of, that, uh, some of that is kind of uh, hacky, right? So Swift 3.0 is helping make that a little bit smoother and abstracting out some of the core like I.O. sort of things and system level things so that later on when you want to port it to a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or something like that, the work is much more smooth. Type system cleanup for the type checker and things like that for, for compilation time, that goes back to the quality of implementation issues. Right? Complete generics. Like an array of comparable cannot be said to conform to comparable, right? So that's one of the features that they point out that they would like to work with generics, which also include protocols with type aliases. And uh, focus and refinement, right? Just the general, uh, this, this is type system cleanup, this is quality of improvement or quality of implementation. This is all of those, those things where, you know, looking at the project is the future of Swift clear. 
And I want to call this, this out because right now, API design guidelines, right, the things that should help us figure out how we name properties, how we name methods, how we name types, the, the design guidelines are actually up for review right now on Swift Evolution, the Swift Evolution mailing list. If you have not checked out the Swift Evolution mailing list, please do, especially right now, because if you read those guidelines and they're not clear to you, now is the perfect time to actually say that, because they're considering rewriting them. All right, so we have this language, and it's ours. Right, so how, how do we care for and maintain Swift? How can we contribute? What is, what is it that each of us as developers, as wonderful, unique butterflies and snowflakes, what can we bring to the table? The first thing, and this, if you listen to nothing else in this talk, please, the one thing that I would really like for everyone to do is to actually use the language. Use the language, write projects, uh, write small projects, big projects, teach people how to use the language. Observe what happens when you teach people how to use the language. Figure out what they hit, hit on you know, as, as a problem, as a snag, right? Um, because one of the things that you'll notice, one pattern that you'll see is if you begin your letter or your, uh, your email to Swift Evolution with, I don't really use Swift, but I think it would be nice if, so the core team is wonderful about responding to all posts, you know, whining, uh, complaining, I don't use Swift, but I would use it if, you know, like, uh, you know, I am very important. The, all of these things, right, they're, they're wonderful at responding, but they are much more likely to respond well and positively if you can present them with, hey, this is what, I've written this code, and this is what has gone wrong. Uh, Again, quoting Chris Latner, you can only test it, and it in this case is a language, right, by looking at a large enough body of code and seeing what problems they face. The full quote talks about the fact that, you know, the goal for the Swift team was to put Swift in front of everyone and actually look at the problems that developers brought back to them. You know, they're, they're not really interested in philosophical answers. They're not really interested in high-minded answers. They want to know what, what things do uh, developers actually trip up on? Like what, not what they think they'll trip up on, right? When, when they build, what breaks? When they go to write a new line of code, what actually doesn't happen as they expect, right? The, the next point that I'll, that I'll uh, present is give what you can. Some people say, well, I, don't, I shouldn't contribute to the Swift Evolution mailing list or I shouldn't read because, um, well, I, I can't implement any of those things. And I'll, I'll raise my hand right now as someone who probably right now cannot contribute to the Swift, uh, to the Swift uh, compiler. Right? I might be able to contribute to the standard library. I've, I've written enough Swift for that. But even some of that is, is out of my depth. But there are keywords, there are concepts, there are uh, hang-ups that I can point out as someone who maybe isn't completely uh, compiler-minded. Right? I've, I've already proposed a keyword for tail call optimization, and it was well-received, and hopefully it, at some point it will actually be merged in and, and accepted. But I, I did not have implementation details. I had to listen to Joe Groff, I had to listen to Chris Latner, I had to listen to all of these people who came back and told me, well, if you're going to propose this, this is what you need to consider, right? Just based on the implementation or just based on, you know, knowing enough code and enough about this problem domain. Another thing to think about is that you should work towards understanding the Swift that you have written and what you want from the language. Right? Keep that in mind. I am interested in semantics. I'm interested in writing beautiful code. I'm interested in solving problems with that beautiful code. But that's a very different approach and, and mindset than someone who is interested in networking or concurrency, right? Um, you know, writing a futures library, I would imagine, influences very much what you hope Swift will have feature-wise. 
be willing to reframe your concern, please. When you propose something, if you have a wonderful solution for a problem that you've noticed, and then that solution is perhaps rebuffed, consider that the problem is independent from the solution. Again, the core team is very, very good about telling you why they think that something is not a good uh, solution. And usually in telling you why, there's a seed for a, a different solution to the same problem. And that other solution probably has a good chance of actually being accepted. So please, consider that. The core team, the core team spends a lot of time that we don't actually see in features put in front of us. Uh, this quote is a great example because without Dave Abrahams telling us that they had had this conversation, that he took notes, we would have no idea how much time they'd actually considered, uh, how much they had time spent, how much time they had spent considering properties and naming and you know, what should be a property and what should not be a property. And this gets to the point that Swift has a history. The core team knows that history much better than we do, but now that it's in Git and now that they're, they're publicly sharing this history, we can learn it. Right? Please remember that time is a completely finite resource. As much as I would love for Swift to have concurrency and all of the things for 3.0, I, you know, I, every, every day I wake up and think to myself, why isn't Swift 3.0 yet? <sighs> right? It's because there is just not enough time to do that, right? I imagine that all of the people in the core team, everyone who's contributing, you know, they have lives, they sleep, they eat, they love, they dream, right? All of these things. Please, please use Swift, research, find the history, find you know, discussions. Sometimes that's in proposals, sometimes that's in Git, sometimes that's in forum posts. Don't hesitate to contribute for whatever reason. If, if you don't have time to research, that's fine. People will let you know, but be willing to listen to that feedback. Swift is young, and this is great. And this is why everyone should, you know, maybe tomorrow, because we're going to all commingle and talk, but maybe tomorrow you should go read the, the mailing list, contribute, especially talk about the design uh, guidelines, and, and get out there and help Swift become a great language that you love and that you know, solves the problems that you care about. Thank you very much, and uh, that's all.